What did you wish for and did anyone ask it for you? If you asked for happiness and family and joy, then your wishes are alien to this place. It can only grant you copies of such and so they will never hold. Therefore, it is pertinent to ask if the wish was asked by you or by an identification that can only live in this realm and so fears at every corner of existence. Have you noticed how in recent years many people flocked quickly and abruptly to any of the available organized religions the realm itself provides? Why? Surely there is there a search for meaning, of course there is. But the main aspect of it is the fear of being left out, as the identifications with this world sense the scythe's blade approaching. Whose scythe is it? God's? The devil's? Is one supposed to fear the devil and then also fear God, lest he forget about you in tantrum, because you didn't obey rules that not even he, much less his priesthoods, can make up their minds about? No, my friends, by now you probably already understood that God and the devil are two of the many faces worn by this realm of shadows. All of its faces demand fear, and no true father would forget about his children, nor let them come to permanent harm. So, neither God nor the devil are our truth, even if they did create our identities, both in body and in soul. Yet a body is held together by continuous maintenance in vulnerability and fragility, and the soul emerges from a fragmented mind and is capable of understanding truth directly as the shadow of a tree is able to understand the light beyond the actual tree giving the shadow form. Do not take me wrong as I have stated in the contemplation named Christianity. I think organized religion have, in its outlines, truth beckoning our attention if we turn away our focus from the details. This is especially verifiable among those religions that act, in official history given by the realm, as a second sort of branch or spin-off idea to a supposed previous background religion. This second religion always defies that background, denounces that cult and presents something new but is then integrated into the first as if it was part of it. So, as examples, Christianity acts as the second religion for Judaism, Buddhism acts as this second religion to Brahmanism, and Manichaeism acts as this second religion to Zoroastrianism. If one looks closely at these second religions, as I'll label them, their outlines will far, will far more easily shine with truth connection, when removed the details that glue them together with their first religion counterparts. And there, fear is gone, you will notice. No fear there, neither of gods or devils. It is of essential importance to realize what this place is, and especially what it isn't. Is this realm independent and immutable? No. Time is its curse in that regard, as it tries to hold together, pretending it is something that it is not. Time will always destroy its mask of supposed independence by revealing its core dependency on power, as it will destroy, as well, its pretense of immutability, as it causes change upon change continuously, forcing a never-ending labor to maintain the deception that it is objective. This is the realm of subjectivity, and it is, so, subject to continuous change as something true wouldn't be. What is true here is true there, what is true now is true then, yet all it can do here is to shift perceptions and rewrite memory among the amnesiac to do all that it can do which is to pretend. The realm itself and its very own Wizard of Oz puts up a very stern show and enforces it seriously. But we have all as children, at least I did, played with our own miniature cars and toy soldiers 
and made up narratives that would bring the stories to a conclusion that was satisfactory to our artificer minds. And we took them seriously. But no matter how seriously we took it, it was never true, regardless of our preferences or pretense. Once when I was about 13 or 14, can't say exactly, I even wrote a small adventure book in which a small boy went into a cave where the core of evil dwelt and, by killing that core, all evil was forever defeated. Again, don't take me wrong. It was symbolically very important for me individually. But after I finished writing it and reading it, nothing had changed around me in the realm. The book and its story wasn't true, no matter how much I wanted it to be. No, I have no idea what happened to that handwritten notebook where I wrote that, probably lost during some move or whatever. I do remember the outline, but the details are never that important. So, going back to the initial questions, uh, what did you ask for and did anyone ask it for you? If, again, you asked for happiness and family and joy, and if you ask that from a perspective of things and sensations and events within the realm we are all in, then you did not ask it yourself, but merely allowed an identification to ask it for you, in the same manner that a very intelligent and cunning fish that can only breathe in water would try to convince you to ask for the entire existence to be flooded with water so that it could continue surviving as a fish. And with it, drowning all those poor creatures that can only breathe air, like monkeys do. But you know what? Neither allowing the fishes to wish for an all-water environment, nor allowing the monkeys to wish for an all-air environment, is true. Because neither water nor air are independent, immutable, and, therefore, truly living. And neither are fishes or monkeys. The fish and the monkey both ask, in this metaphor, for the contrary of what they fear. One fears absence of water, the other absence of air, and if any of them get their way, they will exterminate the other. From the fish's perspective, breathing water is good, and breathing air is evil. From the monkey's perspective, contrarywise, breathing air is good, and breathing water is evil. That is how fragile this dreamland is. Good and evil within it are like air and water, and so, being subjective, are both false. If one prefers to label good as truth and evil as falsehood, then they are both evil, too. In this false realm, everything has a price, hence all the sacrifice we witness. For the wishes of some to materialize, others will have to suffer. So be neither a fish nor a monkey, ask neither for water or air, for good or for evil, according to your perspective from within the realm. Yet if despite this advice you did ask, and continue to do so, then regardless of how much you fear or wish it was life, this world can only show you death, as time will take away every little thing you cling to, be them good or evil from your perspective. So, do not ask for attachment. Heck, let go of the fish and let the monkeys loose. <laughs> Neither are true. Please see the description for a sketch by Kids in the Wall that will help you understand this monkey, monkeys are loose joke. However, if you asked for the truth and consequently for true life, then your wish is being granted. This is that one wish that no one can ask for you in commitment. The wish for truth. So if truth was your wish, then it could only have been asked by the part of you that remembers living, and neither a fish or a monkey identifying as you. So observe attentively, both externally and internally, because, like an onion, the layers of falsehood are coming down. It was inevitable, time being the curse it is to the power-clinger demons, so they wrote it down in prophecy, which is no prophecy, but a recipe of symbols to trigger our interest in what's in the oven, 
to make us drool over what's cooking, as on cue as a Pavlov dog to its bell. Run towards the oven, expecting a meal, if you so wish it. But be aware that you will find that the meal being served is you, your soul. By enticing fear, even masked as false love, and promising a feast, the lamb will bow down to the cook and enter the oven for the roast. It was no lie, the feast was real. But, if you so accepted it, you are the food laid on the table. Or would you, by fear of having your soul consumed, prefer to be on the other side, like a good demon, waiting to be served some other soul at the table? If you asked for truth, then you chose no feast, but only life. And before life can be made manifest in you, you must first wash away the death that is attached and to which one identifies. Demons are no friends of ours, make no mistake, at least no more so than our digestive uh, bacteria. They'll eat the shit we hold on to. <laughs> I'll finish off with this scene from the movie Jacob's Ladder, where the chiropractor is quoting Meister Eckhart. I was in hell. I don't want to die, Louis. And I'll see what I can do about it. It's all pain. Straighten out your head. You ever read my stack art? No. How'd you get your doctor without reading that god? Eckhart saw hell, too. You know what he said? He said the only thing that burns in hell is the part of you that won't let go of your life. Your memories, attachments, they burn them all away. But they're not punishing you, he said. They're freeing your soul. Good. So the way he sees it, if you're frightened of dying and, and you're holding on, you'll see devils tearing your life away. But if you've made your peace, then the devils are really angels freeing you from the earth. It's just a matter of how you look at it, that's all. So don't worry, okay? <laughs>